uh, I want to um, introduce myself. I'm, I'm the director of the Indigenous Education Institute. And David B. Gay, who you all know well, is the uh, vice president. And he is right now home with COVID, unfortunately. So he is going to try to call in, but he's doing much better than he did yesterday. So it, it's a good report uh, from there. Uh, anyway, um, I'm Cherokee in Navajo. I'll introduce myself in Navajo and then continue here. Bibiton initially, although Cherokee Bashish Chin, Cherokee Dashiche, Senjikini Dashinali. Um, that's for you Navajo speakers. And um, anyway, I'm from the, um, the Four Corners area, Bluff, Utah, White Rocks area of the Navajo Nation, the northern part of the Navajo Nation. Um, we've been sponsoring this series. This is about our 13th speaker now. And all of the talks are uh, recorded and they're located on our IEI Indigenous Education Institute website, which is Indigenous edu.org and you can um, come in and, and listen to some really outstanding talks um, you can download them for free and a lot of people are using them in their classroom as a matter of fact in princeton and yale and places like that it was a, quite a surprise to me when i started finding that out even robin kimmerer uses things from that website list um, some of the speakers in her own classes so that was quite a compliment um, we're partnering in this series now with the Superfund of Oregon State University under the able leadership of Diana Rollman and, the, and um, um, her, her staff. And so they will be putting on um, a couple more of these sessions. And we have two more exciting sessions coming up also in February and March. So stay tuned. Um, we have a lot of interest in this talk today, uh, which includes the cast, the whole, um, a lot of the, I think a lot of the staff of the We Are Water Project. And some of you like Johnny and Chris will remember um, Ann Gold, who's the PI. Um, I'm, I'm a co-PI, by the way. Um, she came to Window Rock uh, virtually and, um, talked about that project. And so a lot of you were involved with that. And a big thanks to Chris and Carolyn and everybody, um, Jose, everybody who was there in person. So um, there's a lot of interest spreading across the country. Another group that's very interested in this series is um, the University of Alaska, the, um, the Museum of Northern, uh, the Museum of, oh, the Arctic, I guess it's called. It's it's a part of the University of Alaska. They're very interested in joining forces with us on this project, um, the speaker series. So um, anyway, without spending any more time on that, it gives me great, great pleasure to introduce our two speakers today. They are people we've been wanting to have on and introduce to you for a long time. And I think um, this is just um, really exciting. There's even students from like Blanding High School and, and Middle School that are coming on this to listen today. So it's attracting a larger audience than and more diverse audience than we've even had before. So let me introduce to you first, um, Mallory Ketakwe, who is from the rural Pueblo of Zuni in New Mexico. She's from the Badger clan and child of the Turkey clan. She's the mother of two and shares residences in both Albuquerque and Zuni Pueblo. Mallory received her BS in biology with a minor in art studio in the summer of 2009 from UNM Albuquerque. Since 2018, Mallory has been the artist in residence with the Community Environmental Health Program at the University of New Mexico College of Pharmacy. Mallory has used art to translate scientific ideas, health impacts, and research on uranium mines that are currently undergoing study in several indigenous communities. She also creates tailored messaging using art in cancer uh, uh, genome, genomic, I can't pronounce it today, um, research. <laughs> um, 
and oh, let's see here, uh, with the UNM Comprehensive Cancer Center. Her work has been featured on National Institute of Health websites and published in peer-reviewed journals on environmental health and academic medicine. Her painting entitled Our Microflora is on permanent display at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology Department of Biological Engineering. And another noted work of Mallory's was featured as a Google Doodle in November of 2021. So a huge welcome to you, Mallory. And I think at the uh, same time, I'm going to introduce Don, Dr. Manuela Welloff Mann, because um, she will be joining Mallory in, in this presentation. Um, Dr. Welloff Mann is an art historian and chief curator at the IAIA Museum of Contemporary Native Arts in Santa Fe, New Mexico. She previously served as curator at Crystal Bridges Museum of American Art and at the Montana Museum of Art and Culture. With more than 20 years of curatorial experience in museums and galleries, she has curated national and international contemporary Native American art exhibitions. Dr. Welloff Mann received her PhD in art history from the Ruhr University, Bochum, Germany, and her MA degree in art history, archaeology, and pedagogy from the University of Cologne, also in Germany. She has authored numerous exhibition catalog essays, magazine articles, and blogs on American art. Among her publications are the exhibition catalogs Exposure, Native Art and Political Ecology. That was done in 2021. And then Indigenous Futurisms, Transcending Past, Present, and Future. That was 2020. And Action, Abstraction, Redefined, 2019. And Connective Tissue, New Approaches to Fiber in Contemporary Native Art in 2017 as well as an article in the Art Bulletin. And I was really sorry to miss this um, exhibit on the um, art and um, uranium that she curated. And so I'm really thrilled that today she's going to give us a walkthrough on the exhibit. So thank you. Welcome, um, Manuela, and welcome, Mallory. And I will turn it over to you both. Before we start, if I could just interject one other little piece of how this all kind of came about. And um, I think it's important for all of us to recognize that the work that we do does get around and um, we have the, these great opportunities as a result. And this started from Manuela reaching out actually, um, God, what was it about four years ago now? Um, and asking if I would just kind of help on the scientific credibility of this exhibit, advising on that as it went forward and Native Futurisms came out of that with David writing a chapter. Um, many of us got interviewed for the catalog for um, expo the exposure exhibit. And we're now talking about the possibility, we literally have had one conversation on this, so this is something though that we want to explore, the possibility of, of taking this model further, and um, Mallory and Anjali have been involved in that as well as Manuela, on is there a way that we can develop internships possibly that would put artists from IAIA into partnership with our scientists and perhaps indigenous um, people in courses at SIPI to develop art and translation of science as partners in the long term. So kind of keep that in the back of your mind as you see what a beautiful job um, Manuela did pulling together the exposures exhibit. So I will stop there, but just to give everybody that background. Oh, thank you, Johnny. That's really important. Um, I, I think it was the relationship you had with Manuela that gave us the idea that um, we too could reach out to her through you. And, and I'm, that's why I'm so glad to see her here today. I, I also want to mention that I'm, I have a lot of family in the Four Corners area, and um, they 
and several of them are artists at a young age, like a freshman in high school or a senior in high school, they were very interested to hear about this particular session because they're kind of trying to think, where am I going to go next? What can I do with my art? And um, I was talking to some of the other day and they said, I said, well, you should look and see what Manuela and what um, Mallory are doing. And I, I gave them the link to come into this um, because they probably will talk about how they got to where they are today. And, and so, you know, you can go down to lower grades and inspire kids right there and then. And that's often a really good time to reach them. So um, I think that, that this, this, everything we're talking about here has tremendous potential to expand it and, and create even more diversity among the audience. So thank you, Johnny, for your comment there. Thank you so much, uh, Nancy, for your kind introductions and Johnny for your excellent uh, comments. And it's a great idea. We definitely should follow up on that, on the internship idea. And uh, thank you for inviting me to be part of the METAL's um, in Indigenous Education programs. Um, so exposure, uh, native art and political ecology uh, documents international Indigenous artists' responses to the impacts of nuclear testing and uranium mining on Indigenous communities and the environment in the United States and around the world. And um, Thank you um, also to Caroline for being my <laughs> navigator. For some reason, um, I have some technical issues here. I wasn't able to share uh, the screen. So Caroline will drive us through the galleries. So we can um, pause here for a moment. And um, I will talk a little bit more about um, what exposure is about. Um, so nuclear colonialism is an international problem. Worldwide, the majority of uranium mining and atomic bomb tests have been conducted on tribal lands. Indigenous artists from Australia, Canada, Greenland, Japan, French Polynesia, including Tahiti, and the United States, including American Samoa, Guam, and Hawaii, utilize <laughs> tribal knowledge combined with indigenous and contemporary art forms as visual strategies to comment on nuclear exposure issues in their communities. This exhibition was um, co-curated by international indigenous co-curators, including IBNL director, Dr. Koan Jeff Beiser and Hokkaido Museum, or Hokkaido Museum of Modern Art uh, chief curator, Satomi Igarashi and um, Nuuk Art Museum Director Nivi Christensen, she is Inuit from Greenland, and Art Gallery uh, of New South Wales Assistant Curator of Aboriginal Art Erin Fink, and Canadian First Nation Independent Curator Tanya Willard. And exposure was supported, supported by generous grants from the Ford Foundation and Andy Warhol Foundation for Visual Arts. So the first artwork is a self-portrait by Inuit artist Bulata Zili Hook, and it's a part of a series of self-portraits uh, she created uh, um, shortly after uh, the Greenland Parliament voted to allow uranium um, mining and testing. So um, the government um, voted to allow this in 2013. Uh, things have changed now. So in the meantime, there was another vote, and now, thankfully, they voted against it. But um, in 2013, when this decision was ma made, um, Bolata Zili Hook um, told and told us in her artist statement that she was physically ill. So she um, stayed in bed for three days because she was so devastated about hearing uh, about this decision. Um, what you need to know is um, the, the uranium deposits are in the south of Greenland um, in, a, in a mountain range. And that's also the only area um, where um, there's agriculture, uh, especially sheep farming. So that's why you see the bloody uh, sheep skull on her body. Um, so um, she was very concerned um, that if uranium mining happens, 
that the dust uh, from the mine would contaminate um, the land and the water. So sheep farming um, is one of the main uh, food sources in Greenland. Um, the majority of the island really consists of rock formation and as we all are much aware of, the inland, inland ice is melting at really a rapid speed. So um, that means that um, other ura uh, uranium deposits are more easily um, accessible for mining companies. So um, many artists like Bola Jazilihuk are very concerned about um, global warming and the effect it could have on mining, especially uranium mining and um, the pollution and um, the contamination as a result of that. So this is our first artwork and um, the curators and I decided um, to install it right in the foyer of our museum um, because it kind of sets a tone. Um, it's, it's very intense and many artists are directly affected by uranium mining, atomic bomb tests, nuclear disasters. So um, now, Caroline, we can have a look inside the gallery. I also shared the link to our um, 3D um, virtual exhibition experience um, in the comment box. So everybody can copy this link and um, visit uh, this show again after we are done here. So Caroline, if you could uh, move to the right, there was a glass installation. Yeah. And sometimes it takes a little bit back and forth. It's like driving a car. <laughs> and I'm very well known for crashing into walls. So I'm glad Caroline is helping us out here. <laughs> so you might want to turn right, yeah. So we need to turn to the right. I'm sorry, I should have, uh, should have practiced a little first. Oh, no, no, you're fine. <laughs> and actually, you know, if, um, you want to zoom in on, so on an art? Trying to go work. back to the beginning. Yeah, it's um, on the right side. So you enter the gallery. It's directly at the right side. There you go. So this work um, is by an Australian Aboriginal <laughs> artist. It's tricky, especially the first works on the right. We can stop here. That's an excellent view. <laughs> if you want to back up a little bit with your arrows yeah that's that's the that's the one thing i'm having trouble doing oh that. i see well um <laughs> it's fine you know what um this is uh to the right is it's a good um, example um so the artist again is yoni scars and she's best known for her large glass installations that comment on the effects of the british atomic bomb tests on aboriginal lands in australia from the 1950s to the mid 1960s so most of our audience members and also um, myself, I, I had no idea that this actually happened. And that's the reason why uh, Yoni Scars creates these glass works. Um, her family lived, for, lived about 15 hours west um, of Maralinga. That's where the British Army conducted nuclear testing in the 1950s, dusts and clouds uh, traveled from the site across the state and many tribal members who were not evacuated from the area died or got severely ill. And um, what's really um, awful is the infant death rate was also very high during and after those tests. So Yoni um, Scars has created work that references these events she felt were not being talked about in Australia. Uh, scars glass bush plums. So that's what we are looking at here. So she um, is well known for uh, creating traditional food like a desert yam, or in this case, um, bush plums uh, in glass um, to um, address this issue. So her uh, bush plums are works that reference how nuclear tests affected children during that time. The bush plums are deformed to represent children born with birth defects. And she uses glass as a medium because the extreme heat from the atomic bomb explosions turns sand into glass. 
she decided to use steel blue for glass for the glass plums since it is a color similar to strontium 90. Strontium 90 is a radioactive chemical byproduct produced by nuclear fission, including atomic bomb explosions. The title of the work is U-235, and it refers to the rarest form of uranium. Only 0.72% of all uranium found in nature is U-235. Mm -hmm. Unlike the majority of uranium, which is U-238, it is fissile. That means it can sustain a nuclear chain reaction. Uranium-235 has a half-life of 703.8 million years. So you can imagine we will have this issue for many, many years. So when you look um, to the left, uh, you see um, a black, insta wonderful, yeah, we can stop here, um, a black um, installation piece. And um, it is actually a real conveyor, piece of a conveyor belt used in mining. Mining has a major impact in northeastern Arnhem Land, Australia, which is located in Northern Territory, Australia. Aboriginal artist Gunibi Ganamba, who grew up in that area, addresses the effects of uh, uranium mining with this old conveyor belt, an object that has expediently transported the riches of his homeland away. He intricately incised the conveyor belt with clan symbols for fresh water. These detailed designs have been firmly attached to place since centuries and denote ownership of and responsibility to the land, highlighting rights that have been eroded as the surface of the land itself has been removed. The artist, oh, that's a wonderful view there. The artist is also very concerned about how mining has polluted the fresh water in the area where he grew up. We used um, this um, design actually also uh, for the cover of our exhibition catalog. We were so intrigued with um, these patterns and also the importance of um, keeping the fresh water, the water clean. It's a major, major issue for especially tribes living close to desert areas. Um, Caroline, if you could then um, go straight forward um, across this piece uh, on the center wall. Yes, exactly. We have two artworks and can just, um, oh, we have to go back in. To turn right. And further right. Or, oh, no, sorry, to the left. It's either way. You can make a full circle or go back to the left. Yep, we're getting, yes. And you can stop here. So these are um, two works um, on the left. Um, it's a work by um, Dan McMullen, a mixed, yeah, that's wonderful. Thank you, Carolyn. A mixed media painting. Um, it shows images of bikini women and men's forced migration from their island, islands alongside a controversial image of a cake in the shape of an atomic bomb on the lower left of the painting, um, being cut and served by Admiral Blandy and his, and his wife in Washington, DC. Blandy was in charge of Operation Crossroads and other atomic tests in the South Pacific. And Blandy was also a central figure in propaganda films, falsely portraying the displacement of Bikini Islanders as voluntarily. <coughs> So you have to really imagine at the same time the US Army conducted those atomic bomb tests in the South Pacific and Islanders lost their homeland. There was a party in Washington DC with a cake cutting and the cake had the form of yeah, a, an atomic bomb explosion. So this is really um, horrific to even imagine that. 
So to the right, um, we have a Canadian Anishinaabe artist, Carl Beam, um, and he juxtaposed a photo photographic images of Einstein, whose research helped building the atomic bomb, and Sitting Bull, uh, the famous Lakota chief. Beam positions Sitting Bull on top of the composition to challenge Western value systems that would normally visualize the scientist and genius of Einstein on top of the picture. Instead, we are asked uh, to consider the genius of indigenous way of knowing that warn against the uh, extraction of uranium. So while I was curing, curating uh, this show with my fellow co-curators, cur I really learned a lot. And one of the things I learned, first of all, how connected things are, but also, um, that many um, tribal cultures have stories of origin that clearly warn against the extraction of uranium. That was really fascinating to learn. Um, so if we then turn to the left yeah. and past the glass uh, installation, so we move past the glass installation. Yeah, that's great. Um, we can actually stop here. Yes, that's that's perfect. Thank you, Carolyn. So um, here we have um, two Australian paintings. The one on the left um, is by Betty Muffler. She's an internationally known. She's internationally known for her black and white painting style. Uh, as a healer and Maralinga survivor, she often paints sites in Anangu country that have positive healing energy and those that have yet to heal from radiation contamination. The title of the work is Healing Country and Muffler depicts the many rock holes um, and the water that flow through um, Anangu country. So uh, interestingly, um, Aboriginal um, tribal members refer to their homeland as country. It's kind of like here, uh, reservation or in Canada reserve. So often um, they talk about country. So when it rains, uh, the rock holes at the top of the canvas um, are the first to fill and then water flows down to the other rock holes indicated by the wavy lines on the painting. Um, and what uh, you need to know is that um, there were several, um, an entire series of major atomic bomb tests conducted in country. And then um, about um, 120 so-called minor atomic bomb tests. So with every explosion, you have this uh, toxic black mist that then contaminates the water holes, which are very important for the survival of many tribal members. Within the work, um, the scratchy zigzag lines um, traverse the canvas and also refer to the energy that flows through people and places. This is an invisible energy that connects Anangu to country, to their homeland, invisible to all but the healer. So you can um, see that um, the connection to the land is, is really, really close. And it's so close that um, Betty Muffler as a healer actually can see the connection and she um, represents this energy um, through her zigzag lines on the painting surface. The work to the right um, was created by Karika Bell Davidson and it's titled Maralinga Bomb. It depicts country immediately after an atomic bomb explosion embedding within the landscape Ananango, who immediately suffered sickness or died due to radiation fallout. She painted the rock holes um, located <coughs> alongside her bush home in Vilkura, which was where she and her young son were camping during a bomb blast. The painting features circular shapes in green that takes the form of windbreaks set up to protect Ananangu from the poisonous black mist. Within these um, green circles, you can see um, 
there is um, a blue circle, which um, probably represents water holes. What you can't see here is you would, um, would have to really zoom in very closely are white dots. So within the green circle are white dots. Those are people gathering. Yes, I think one can see it. That's great. There are people gathering around the water holes. So after the explosion, uh, she says um, people immediately got sick, some were dying. And um, oh, yeah, this is a good view. And unfortunately and tragically, her own infant son died um, as, a, as a, a result of the atomic bomb explosion. Um, the middle and lower section of the work features dazzling fields of red and brown dots. Um, these um, identify spots, spot fires that burned on country long after an explosion. So this is really a very tragic um, a story about an artist who lost her own child as a result of an atomic bomb explosion. So what happened was um, the government uh, allowed the British army to conduct these um, tests without even consulting with the tribes. They just um, allowed it and they thought they evacuated um, all tribal members, but um, there, there were several tribal members who were actually uh, camping, hunting um, in country, and um, they never uh, learned about these planned tests, and many of them died or were se severely sick. So um, we can turn to the left. There's a large metal um, cast iron sculpture. Yeah, there it is. And this work is by um, Japanese Ainu artist um, Kohi Fujito. Um, so it consists of many iron spirals with thorns protruding on all sides and they're connected to form a star-shaped sculpture. Spiral patterns with thorns can be found on traditional Ainu clothing because I know patterns with thorns are believed to protect the body from evil spirits. In this case, the radiation from the Fukushima nuclear power plant disaster. And I don't know if you can zoom in further. Um, if not, it's, it's fine. In the center of the sculpture, maybe you have to go around a little bit to the left. There is a skull and it's, um, I can see the skull already. Um, so a skull of a deer painted, um, yeah, that's a good view. One can see it in the center left. Um, a skull of a deer painted with a blue, white, and red Ainu design is placed in the center of the sculpture representing wildlife affected by the Fukushima nuclear power plant disaster. The work consists of 120 metal plates and um, each one has four spirals. The surface of the metal plates is, is uh, polished and looks like a mirror, but the underside uh, is covered with red dust. It looks as if it has been corroded by an invisible poison in the air. The artist Kohi Fujito explains, when the accident at the Fukushima nu nuclear power plant occurred, I became hypersensitive to the direction of the wind and closed the curtains around the house. I wanted to make a curtain that could protect my family from the radiation carried by the wind. So um, we can move on. Um, immediately to the left is another Australian painting. Yeah, I can see it there, there it is. Um, this is um, a collaboration between uh, two artists. One is Kunmanawa Kiyama, and the other one is Hilda Mudu. And their painting alludes to the British nuclear test uh, operations Buffalo in 1956 and Antler in 1957 and the mushroom cloud. While not the first original artist to paint the cloud, they were the first to present the cloud in the unique and recognizable dot painting style, a technique belonging to the people from the desert regions. In both artists, um, Kun Manara Kiyama and Hilda Mudo are also activists. Um, they became um, very instrumental in the movement to return 
oh, this is wonderful. One can see the dot painting style. So they were instrumental in um, returning Ananangu um, tribal members to country, to their homeland when it was safe. So now we can um, go further left to have a look at a large, yeah, you have to go around the corner. So the right now, there it is. It's a large installation piece. It's titled um, Kulata Tuta, Many Spears. Yeah, there it is. You can basically stop here. It addresses um, the effects of the atomic weapons test on Anangu country at Imu Junction and Maralinga. So there were three major test sites. One was Imu, Imu Junction, one was Maralinga, and the third one was um, Monte, uh, Monticello Island. And those tests were conducted in uh, between 1953 and 1963. Um, the spears hang in an explosive cloud formation, frozen in time and hovering above an installation of hand carved bowls made by Anangu women. Internally lit from a single light source, it casts shadows from the explosion on the surrounding walls, alluding to the black mist, which caused illness and death for many Anangu tribal members. And then uh, in the background, you see monitors. So we have six monitors showing interviews with survivors. And um, that's great. One of the survivors um, is the late Kunmanara Lester, and the entire work is also dedicated to him. Lester lost his sight as a young man through the bomb tests that were conducted on country. So he was um, a young man and when the bomb test um, happened, he looked directly into the explosion and got blind from that. Regardless, mm. Lester worked tirelessly, dedicating his life to ensure the horrors of the Emu field and Maralinga tests um, and its consequences were made public. So it's uh, still an issue, um, only slowly um, government officials acknowledge that this happened. Um, tribal members who address this problem and um, also address their um, symptoms and illnesses. They were often brushed away and it was explained away with potential other um, um, causes of this illness, of the cancer. So only slowly uh, in publication, um, people are talking about what really happened uh, in the 50s and 60s. And then when we turn uh, right around the corner, there is a wooden mask. Yeah, we just passed it. So it's by um, Northwest Coast artist, David Neal. It's a cedar mask and it, um, yeah, we can stop here. Um, it's painted um, with three large nuclear power plant cones in the center of its forehead referring to recent memories of nuclear disasters like Chernobyl, Three Mile Island, and the Fukushima nuclear power plant accident. Neil's mask is based um, on the mask of the Bakwis, or wild man of the woods, which is a character from his culture. And um, so Bakwis is the chief of the ghost and he tricks people into eating his food, which may be disguised as a delicious salmon, but is in fact grubs or rotten wood. And afterwards, his victims are trapped in the land of ghosts. So the artist asks, is this where we find ourselves today trapped in the post-nuclear age, a land of ghosts? So you can really see how he uses um, the characteristic Northwest um, carving styles, the mask, the rich tradition of um, wooden masks to address the issue of the dangers of nuclear power plants. So now we can try to enter the next gallery. So we have to turn right. 
yeah, that's a good view. So at the end um, of this gallery, we see a larger installation by an Ishinabi artist, Bonnie Divine. And it's called uh, Phen Phenomenology. Uh, and it's um, an installation using 92 um, ghostly figural muslin sheets uh, on a pole. And originally, the artist has installed, had installed this work outside. So you can probably imagine how the, min, the wind moved the muslin fabric. And um, it was on purpose, the artist wanted to make visible the wind. And especially in the region where she grew up and where she lives, um, there are several um, Uranian um, mines and mills. And with that, you have the con a contamination of the wind, which you usually wouldn't see. So the fabric really serves the purpose of making wind and the danger that comes with that wind visible. Um, the number 20, uh, 92 is also on purpose. 92 <coughs> is the uranium's uh, atomic number and represents the 92 protons and 92 electrons in an uranium atom. In 1953, uranium was found in a mountain sacred to Anishinaabe people near the Serpent River First Nations Reserve, and the subsequent mining led to a poisonous poisoning of the entire Serpent River watershed. Also part of this installation um, are rocks. Um, so there's a large stone on this wall sh shelf, and um, uh, really interestingly, and um, what's really scary is this um, stone, this large stone, looks to the naked eye very similar to a tiny um, sample of uranium, which one can actually buy on Amazon. So um, funny side story, um, when we tried to import this installation from Canada to the US, um, the shipping company, the art, com art shipping company was um, very nervous and asked us if we could please um, leave out the piece of uranium to the left. It's, yeah, you can see it there. And um, yeah, we said, yeah, sure, we will consult with the artist what to do. And we were prepared to receive this installation piece without this uranium sample. And Bonnie Divine um, also agreed that's fine to ship it without because um, we as a museum, we can actually buy uranium, a simple, uh, a tiny um, sample like this on Amazon. So I had no idea one can do that. So um, what I found interesting is that both the stone she collected from the Serpent River watershed shed and the uranium piece looks so similar. I wouldn't be able to tell the difference. And I think that's part of her message. Uh, it's, it's a warning if you don't even know about, um, you know, this dangerous material, why as humans do we mess with it? Again, there are so many um, tribal stories um, that warn us um, and to ask us to leave it in the ground where it belongs. But um, unfortunately, as we know, um, companies, mining companies don't, scientists say they don't listen. So then um, you can turn around, um, maybe, yeah, there's a small basket in the center of the gallery. We can zoom into that. And it's a bit tricky. Um, I tried it this morning. Uh, so any kind of you will work. Um, so this basket is by Pat Courtney Gold and um, she's uh, Vasco Vam Springs and she uses customary weaving techniques as a response to radioactive poisoning. Um, her sturgeon basket, that's the title of the piece, her sturgeon basket is woven in the shape of a sally bag, a Columbia River Plateau basketry style, characterized by a cylindrical shape and used to carry and store foods. The design features abstract patterns inspired by ancient petroglyphs from the area. The main motif consists of five sturgeons, fish honored by Pacific Northwest tribes 
for their strength, size, and long longevity. They can grow larger than 10 feet, weigh more than a thousand pounds, and live approximately a hundred years. The bottommost uh, sturgeon um, is laced with iridescent synthetic threads. If you want to try that, you have to um, move to the right and zoom in, so kind of 90 degrees around the piece. Um, so it has this kind of um, gold colored iridescent synthetic thread, which according to gold represents radioactive isotope, isotopes. Yeah, that, there it is. Yeah, we can stop here. So the, the sturgeon at the very bottom, you can see it here on the left la side, exactly has um, a nice gold thread. And it represents radioactive isotopes from the Hanford site, a nuclear facility whose waste has contaminated the Columbia River system during the past seven decades. As a result, sturgeons, a traditional food source for area tribes, are suffering from deformations and toxins. Um, at the beginning, I mentioned I learned so much, especially how connected things are. Um, when I uh, talked uh, with my Canadian co-curator, Tanya Willard, she explained to me that um, actually the uranium used for the atomic bomb tests um, and for the development of the um, atomic bomb here in Los Alamos actually came from Canada, from Saskatchewan. And it was then enriched or refined at the Hanford site in Washington, polluting the Columbia River where Pat Courtney Gold lives. So, and uh, because um, here we at um, the Los Alamos laboratories excluded British um, scientists who were originally part of the development of the atomic bomb, um, so we excluded these scientists, uh, Great Britain as a nation. They thought, um, or they, um, it prompted them to develop their own atomic bomb, which they then tested in Australia. So it's it's just uh, fascinating and really terrible and awful how, how things are all connected. And then, um, if you turn to your left, um, on the left wall, there are three photographs by Will Wilson. And um, they show um, the Mexican head disposal cell. So you have to turn around more. Yep, those are the photographs by Will Wilson. So it's a triptych titled Mexican head disposal cell and is part of his Connecting the Dots series. This drone-based photographic survey documents the contaminated sites of abandoned uranium mines and mills and serve as a platform for voices of resilience. Wilson used uh, the format of a triptych to examine the subject of contamination from uranium mines and disposal sites from multiple perspectives. So he basically um, took a drone and uh, documented these disposal sites and zoomed further in. Um, the Mexican hat disposal cell contains 3.1 million cubic yards of radioactive tailings and waste from demolished buildings that were constructed with contaminated materials, including a school. The cell is 1,400 feet long and covers approximately 68 acres. The photos gradually zoom in on a large gray area that looks like a scar in the landscape. It is, 20, it, it is a 20 inch layer of coarsely crushed riprap rock that covers a 24 inch thick radon radon barrier and the contaminated material. So it's kind of scary when you think about it. There is a 24 inch um, radon barrier. I don't even know what that material is. And on top they put the, those um, little rocks and this is supposed to protect us from the contamination. The disposal cell and original mill sites are all on Navajo land. Wilson's intention for this connecting the dots photo survey is to advocate for environmental remediation 
for over 500 abandoned uh, uranium mines on Navajo land. So here in New Mexico, there are over 500 abandoned mines. Um, and um, nationwide, um, there are over a thousand abandoned mines on Navajo land. So this is really a lot. And um, I am sure the majority of the public is not aware of that. So now we have to um, go on a little journey. So we have to leave this gallery and then go through the main gallery and turn, make a sharp right turn past the Buffalo painting and leave this, yep, leave this gallery. So maybe sometimes we can also crash through a wall if that's easier. <laughs> and we would like to look at the gallery to the right, the, the smaller gallery. Yeah, we have to turn right. Yes. Yeah, yeah, and then go along the hallway. And then um, at the second, yeah, not past this entrance, here we turn left. Great, thank you, Carolyn. <laughs> so we want to zoom in on the textile installation uh, on the gray wall, is it right? Yeah. Great. So this fabric installation is titled When They Came Home, and it's, it is a collaboration between three artists. Um, so from the mid-1940s until 1962, many Navajo men worked in the uranium mines and came home with their clothes tarnished by yellow toxic dust from the mines. Women and children were exposed to the radiation at their homes. This installation represents the ways that uranium contamination has affected the lives of many um, tribal women and also the environment. The garment is inspired by customary Navajo clothing and um, also by the weaving to the left. Um, Jane Benali, who created the wall weaving, has experienced the personal trauma of uranium exposure in her family and on her land. In consultation with her son, Navajo writer Malcolm Benelli, uh, one of the artists, her name is Anne Collier, she dyed wool in the colors that represented important elements in Navajo life. And uh, Benali's wall weaving symbolizes in a poetic way the different layers and elements of Navajo land, including the red ochre rock, the sheep, the water, and turquoise. Inspired by Benali's weaving, um, Kim Han and Anne Collier created a, a design for this garment and also the necklace. So this installation is really a reminder how uranium radiation has not only killed many miners, but also women and children who were exposed to the dust at their homes. And Manuela, if I could just um, add, because many of the people on this call know Malcolm. Malcolm okay. worked with our team for a long time and actually designed the logo for the P50 Center, the Center for Native Environmental Health Equity that some of the Northern Plains partners are on the um, call today will remember. And Ann Collier was actually a doc with IHS in oh. Kayenta and worked with us initially on the development of the Navajo birth cohort study. So just to kind of tie a little bit more of this in with our team. That's great. Thank you for, for mentioning that. So the last piece I would like to focus on is um, actually Mallory's painting um, to the right. Unless Mallory, had, did you have planned to talk about your, your painting? If not, I can, I'm happy to share a, a few words and you can then also um, chime in. Um, yeah, so that'll I'll, be a neat segue into my my part. Yeah, so take okay, it away. So, <laughs> yeah, go ahead. So yeah, so Mallory Kitaki's uh, diptych extraction and remediation chronicles uranium mining on indigenous lands from the early 1940s to recent cleanup efforts of contaminated sacred sites. Her petroglyph um, drawings on the left part of the painting represent ancient customs and knowledge, which collide with the modern world symbolized by a circuit board pattern. The uranium vein in the ground 
has a petroglyph-like design and um, is meant to stay in the ground. But um, further along, it escapes the ground, signifying extraction and causing the upper environment to become contaminated as the flowers wilt into radioactive symbols. The rem remediation section on the right comments on the need for, for blending modern science with indigenous customs on knowledge. So only when we both work, um, when bo both work together, when we um, respect and listen to indigenous knowledge and include uh, science, um, we will have a chance of healing the country and the land and nature and the people. So, and with that, I would like to hand it over to Mallory. Thank you. Thank you, Manuela. That was beautiful. Um, it's a really powerful exhibit. Um, where is it right now? Can you let everyone know? Yeah, so um, it is uh, right now in Pasadena, California. So the show closed in Michigan. Um, at, um, I think it's, it's it was in Saginaw, and now um, the Armory Center for the Arts in Pasadena, California, is getting ready to open it. Awesome. Well, this definitely segues into my art, um, especially regarding to what Manuela just said that if we all continue working together and um, you know, giving space to the idea of traditional ecological knowledge and indigenous ways of knowing we can we can do so much with our studies and, and the work we do. Um, hello, everybody. Good afternoon. Um, I know some of you uh, are very familiar with my art. Those here that are uh, frequent to the Metals uh, Center, um, but I know there's a few people that are new today, so I will still kind of give you the rundown of what um, the artist in residence program is here at uh, UNM College or College of Pharmacy's uh, Community Environmental Health Program. So um, just kind of talking about a quick rundown of the origins of how this came to be. Um, from Zuni Pueblo, I was raised um, there with my people within the village speaking and living um, Zuni as much as modernly possible. <laughs> I came to UNM uh, in 2004 to study biology uh, on a pre-medical tract. And uh, I had a series of artwork that um, I decided to make during a uh, anatomy slash um, advanced drawing course. And lo and behold, I created a, an anatomical series of work that now hangs at the Zuni IHS hospital um, um, waiting area hallways. And um, it was there that there was kind of this um, light bulb moment for a lot of us, you know, including myself. I kind of did those paintings as, <laughs> as a killing two birds with one stone project, studying anatomy, uh, the course, and, and then turning something physical in for my uh, art class. And uh, little did I know that it is something that we really needed in our tribal communities, uh, being that we are such um, visual learners. We're, we learn through storytelling. We learn through um, uh, just following um, our uh, elders and and uh, doing um, what we've been doing for you know centuries now. And so, what I didn't know was that um, utilizing art in uh, settings such as uh, healthcare, especially something with a recognizable um, symbology, iconology, even just, you know, imagery that has that Native American experience actually has people kind of come up to it. It catches the eye, they pay attention, and they, um, this series of work actually created this dialogue we needed to happen in Zuni. Um, it's very hard to get patients to be more proactive about their healthcare. Uh, very difficult and a very underutilized part of our uh, our community a healthcare center there is to to just to go in and to check on yourself uh, preventative measures and get screened for cancer and things of that sort. Uh, most people don't go in until they're deathly ill or until it's too late. And so um, 
having that artwork up there, it prompted people to go in and say, hey, is my kidney supposed to look like that? Are my ribs? Is that my heart? Is that a healthy heart? How do I keep it healthy? How do I continue to keep that working? That looks pretty beautiful. Is it really that beautiful? So the, the all these questions um, the physicians were getting and the uh, care providers were like, man, this is really going somewhere. And uh, Johnny uh, was there <laughs> one time and uh, uh, fortunately um, it caught her eye as well. And here I am um, in 2016. Um, we uh, rolled out this uh, artist in residence program to see how we can um, address uh, these issues surrounding abandoned uranium mines to the communities that live in and around it. And so uh, here I am today. And um, I have uh, be, uh, since started utilizing um, three goals to help me create some of the work that I do. And um, first and foremost is, you know, translate the science. Um, I'm sitting there in seminars and I'm still I'm still reading. I still crack open textbooks. I still, you know, reach out to all the um docs in 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 the program I work with and, and everyone that I can to to learn more about these uh, complex processes and all these new things that are coming about to be able to, to um, visually conceptualize these ideas. Um, second major thing is that it needs to bridge uh a bi-directional communication that we, we're not, we don't wanna just talk at these communities. We also want to listen. And art has been able to do that, to share these ideas together with um, the community and, and the researchers. Um, the biggest thing also is to create an inclusive environment for native communities. And this is a big thing when you're collaborating native with native communities that you need to have some sort of trust building mechanism, something that, um, allows them to express, you know, their culture and to have that as part of an important part of research. Um, we want to be respectful. We also want to be inclusive and we also want to correctly um, and respectfully represent uh, our tribal nations that we work with. So um, sample of my work here uh, got to be part of the Tortilla Sanitary Factory exhibit on um, I uh, believe it was uh, regarding the downwinders in the Tularosa Basin area, um, White Sands Range area. So some of this work um, has been uh, done in re like by request to both our native communities and outside communities, um, just like the exposure exhibit. Um, I got to create that um, after learning about exposure and what the exhibit was gonna be about. So. Some of these paintings are prompted um, by uh, researchers oh, Valerie, and those that work. Yeah. Oh, if you don't mind just going into um, presenter mode so we can see your artwork a little bigger as well. That'd be awesome. Oh, really? I Shoot. Okay. Um, let's see. I have it. Um... Yeah, we were just seeing your slides on the side too, but not a big deal. Is this is this better, or is it the same? That's the same. It's 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 great. We just can see the slides on the side too. I thought we could maybe make it bigger, but oh, because I'm, <laughs> I'm looking at the I'm looking at the presenter mode. How about? Oh, this? that's why. Yeah, that's better. There we go. Okay, cool. Yep. Perfect. Yikes! <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, well, glad we're only on the second slide. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, um, let's see. I kind of lost myself over here then. Um, okay, so I went from here. Now I'm going here. Now, okay, so we're going to talk about translating the science. Um, and, and I had mentioned that Sometimes it's the community that requests, and then sometimes it's uh, institutions that work with um, tribal communities that make these requests to help them um, make their information, their uh, teaching back the data, sharing their data more accessible, more easily digestible. Um, speaking of digestible, this is an example of a um, painting requested and commissioned by um, a, a Superfund Center as well, uh, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, um, requested a painting that um, combines um, traditional knowledge systems, 
from the um, the Algonquin speaking tribes of the Northeast Coast. So like uh, the uh, Mi'kmaq, Pasamaquoddy, Penobscot, peoples of the Dawnland, um, and uh, what gut biome health looks like. And so this is a painting describing prebiotics and probiotics and how all the little microbes work in unison, uh, living together in such a biodiverse um, part of our gut and um, makes or breaks a healthy uh, gut system. And so the beadwork, um, this is a big topic for me because it's kind of somewhat a universal art, um, art form across native country beadwork um, can be seen in a lot of uh, communities. So I like using it uh, to compare uh, with like a lot of the other complex systems within our body. So here you see the beadwork pattern starting on the bottom kind of more um, not so much detailed and you go further up to the top part and you see it coming together and being more formed and full. Um, that just represents how um, the uh, prebiotics, um, such as oligosaccharides, you can see in the top corner there, come together and, and make this whole and, and, and the idea of how um, there's this symbiosis happening. So I used, um, reached out to some folks and did a lot of research on symbolism and it always leads me back to feeding. So this is a really neat um, project to do um, utilizing um, traditional ecological knowledge and in indigenous holistic worldviews. And so you ask, um, what is traditional ecological knowledge? Um, it is something that a lot of natives will just say, hey, it's the way we are, it's the way we live, it's the land, the water, the air, the animals, everything around us has a meaning, has a life. And so, and, you know, if you want to throw it in a textbook, it is basically the uh, set of acquired knowledge that took thousands of years from ancestral teachings due to the close relationships we have with the ecosystems, um, living in direct uh, contact with the environment. So um, a lot of this knowledge includes uh, our self-sustaining ways, um, agriculture, um, and um, you know the animals and land seasonal cycles around us. Um, a lot of that, um, all this natural things and cycles that happen within the planet, is very tied to our cultural ceremonies and um, a lot of our you know farming, agriculture, hunting, fishing practices. Everything is in tandem with each other. There is a balance, and so. Um, there is that acknowledgement that no one holds dominion over the land, um, but we are to be stewards and custodians living with the environment and its other inhabitants. So just those ideas are something that we want to share, especially when it comes to research and how we have a lot of interest in areas of our um, ancestral lands that, you know, could be and are, are in um, in the um, um, contaminated areas such as something like the Jack Pile Mine and Laguna. So um, with our metals conceptual model, I decided to use that idea um, to be more representational of the surrounding area instead of using, you know, online icons, um, just kind of general landscapes. I really wanted to make sure that we captured a New Mexican landscape with the mesas and with the the color of the dirt, especially that really, really gets gets me going when I see the, the dirt around us. I, I like, I love it. It's like the best color ever. Um, so I just wanted to show, you know, just the landscape and the scenery for us to overlay a lot of our um, um, models that we use here at um, the Metal Center. And the four um, communities we work with, Laguna, um, Pueblo, and then the three Navajo chapters, the Cameron, Blue Gap, and Redwater Pond are all um, collaborating I do reach out to individuals from these areas to, to, to ensure that we are um, representing um, their concerns as well. Um, we move on to the idea of a holistic world and, and the idea of one being whole. Um, it is an idea that all things on the planet are interrelated. Um, human health especially. Um, human health and well-being is connected to the health of the environment. If the land is sick, we're sick. Um, that is a 
neat uh, phrase that um, Dr. David Begay said to me one day. And so that's always been in the back of my head. It's like everything that uh, the environment goes through, we as a people go through as well, whether or not it's a physical health or our spiritual health. Um, all these ideas are part of our ceremonies and spiritual belief systems, but um, I have to point it out there that not all are universal. Each culture is different. Um, so this painting here um, represents basically to me everybody that works in and around research and science and healthcare within tribal lands um, suffering from environmental uh, contamin contaminants or damages, fracking, all of the above, especially those uh, indigenous scholars who have joined the ranks to use their knowledge systems, whether um, they come from uh, uh, traditional communities or, or they're bringing their uh, scholarly expertise to the front to help fight, you know, the um, grassroots type of um, activism on, on our lands. And so this just kind of talks about how we're using both powers, as you could say, to help our lands, um, you know, bring it back to as close as possible. Um, it'll never be that 100% we, we wish it would be, but we are fighting in, in many ways. And so this just honors those individuals that are uh, taking part in um, research. Um, there's uh, so many ways that um, I help translate science. And sometimes um, I really do have to reach out and really kind of <laughs> uh, yank at people's um, arms to be like, hey, um, what can I express and what what can I not? And so not only am I sitting down, you know, looking through um, old textbooks and old uh, or old, um, you know, books about uh, symbolism, especially, you know, back in the day with the petroglyphs and, and the rock art. Uh, those are my favorite designs to use, but more modern designs. And I like to talk with community members about particular taboos and things that may or may not be allowed to portray in their specific community. So uh, one big example is um, here with uh, Laguna Pueblo and their jackpile mine. Um, we wanted to make a painting uh, regarding um, the BP lung um, project where we wanted to talk about air particulates. And me, I, I would have <laughs> my own without any, if I had not regarded, you know, the, 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 the um, the um, protocols we have within our communities, um, I would have just, you know, I would have painted a lung and having literally this lung inhaling air particulates because I love anatomy, but that's something that's not quite necessary and, and, and shouldn't be really put out there in some communities. So with, um, with that respect and that regard, I, I decided to use other symbolism to represent the um, crossing over of, of air particulates into the lung um, and into the membranes and, and using symbols um, like pottery design, something we wanna keep safe and guarded. Um, and you can see the little specks floating over and crossing those boundaries. And um, this also gave me the, the opportunity to um, throw in an idea about uh, um, phytoremediation and using the uh, the plant designs you see on uh, Laguna pottery, Acoma pottery, the colors. Once again, I said very earthly, very very to to our regions here in the Southwest, and how um, a lot of our ancestors already knew how to pick and choose which plants need to go and which need to stay and which are important. And that's something uh, our studies are also doing right now with um, phytoremediation. So this is a neat topic to, to begin that dialogue with a community that still has a lot of um, social and um, proto, you know, these, these tribal protocols within their communities. Um, and as, as I had said, um, not, not every idea is universal. Um, there are some similarities, and that's where I really like to pull these ideas from. So these two paintings on immunity and autoimmunity or immune response and autoimmunity are like one are my most prime examples of utilizing ideas from cross-cultural um, belief systems. So um, you can see the Navajo wedding basket design and the medicine wheel 
uh, representing here as a cell, healthy human cell that we want to keep protected, guarded, and healthy, and symbolizing what keeps a cell healthy and guarded are, um, you know, B cells, T cells, uh, macrophages, things that uh, recognize and destroy um, um, invading uh, agents such as bacteria and viruses and um, other things like that. So what I symbolize as B cells and T cells were the ideas and symbols uh, we hold and give power to in our systems and our beliefs, um, like the, the buffalo, symbol of power, war pony, symbol of power and protection, bear, symbol, symbol of power and protection, the sweat lodge, a place to go and cleanse and to heal, um, a mechanism for well-being, uh, the arrowhead, a uh, personal protective um, uh, totems, and um, the color turquoise. A lot of us are always adorned with turquoise, but some of our communities will tell you that uh, turquoise is a protective color and a protective stone. So you will see that color in a lot of my work. And so using ideas from here in the Southwest and up in the uh, other um, communities we work with in uh, the Cheyenne River Sioux and the Crow Nation, taking their belief systems, the things that are similar to one another to create something we can all understand and and begin that dialogue that we need to surrounding um, what happens when, you know, we're exposed to certain um, chemical or heavy metal um, things in our bodies. So autoimmunity on the, right, um, the other side shows how our body goes against each other. You'll see the, the buffaloes going head to head and the bears are fighting, the war ponies are fighting each other that just kind of to portray what happens in the autoimmune response. Um, so yeah, and then the other, um, the second goal for the art, artist in resident is definitely bridging that bi-directional communication. I really like um, making sure that our voice as Native people is very clear and concise in, in the work that I do. I do carry every, I do carry, um, you know, that that's something I, I hold to myself as an artist that I want to represent and I want to carry um, voices with me as well. So um, when we talk about research and why sometimes we may push back or why we may not be open to um, um, biological sampling or taking of material from our lands is because we hold this land sacred for many reasons. And um, it, it'd be very, very um, crucial for new scientists and scientists who are not familiar with working with indigenous communities to know these things. Um, so, you know, um, so you have, you know, best practices in your research. So the painting above is of a baby and um, the umbilical cord and the placenta. This one represents, or, you know, is supposed to talk about placental transfer, but it also mainly talks about why our land is so sacred for us. Because uh, when a baby is born, and this is true to both Pueblo and Navajo communities here in the Southwest, is that when a baby is born and their umbilical cord falls off, that umbilical cord is returned to the earth. Um, and each, each culture has a different way of returning it to the earth, but that is what ties us to these lands. Places you may walk upon that look like just, you know, fields and dirt and weeds, might have someone's umbilical cord buried nearby. And so that directly ties us to these places and gives us that sense of um, place for us. And so I just wanted to share that. Um, and obviously also the um, painting that Manuela had recently described, um, these ideas where um, there are stories and there are prophecies within our cultures and our oral histories that tell us of, of of things in the future that could cause us harm. And there are stories out there about the Chaco Canyon area that there is something underground that might cause us to fight one day, might cause our children to be harmed. And we believe that is the ancient prophecy telling us of that, that uranium vein that goes through those, that area, that region of New Mexico. And so that's just something I wanted to share. Um, it allows, you know, 
um, to focus on uh, cultural awareness when we do go out and uh, collaborate and interact with uh, indigenous communities. Um, another way I like to um, create uh, an inclusive environment for our co collaborating communities is to is to make every basically the word I would say is indigenize uh, indigenize um, things that might already exist, but we want to have that uh, recognizable art, something that communities will see and feel accepted, respected, and is relatable to them. Um, as I had mentioned before at Zuni IHS, um, we can have as many infographics about our healthcare uh, posted around, but if it has something of a Zuni origin or a native origin on it, we're gonna stop and take a second look. So um, just, you know, for NBCS Echo, which is another program within uh, CEHP, um, we've been creating Mother's Day cards um, for the last three years for our communities and, so um, I've been going from acrylic painting to digital art recently, back and forth. I'm still learning digital art, but um, that third painting at the top uh, right is uh, one of my digital paintings. It is the changing woman and her twins. And I just wanted to uh, share that with our uh, MBCS families. And we send, we send those out in and around Mother's Day. Um, the first painting there uh, was featured on the NIH website, the landing page for, for about a month. It's still there if you look up the Navajo Nation data sharing agreement that um, is written up there also. Um, and we recently at NBCS Echo rolled out with a new mobile unit. It, it is a real snazzy uh, bus there. It's a van that has um, a, a waiting area, a, a lab hood, and um, an area where we can uh, take uh, medical um, um, testing or uh, measurements from the, the kids when we go collect in, on, on Navajo during our MBCS uh, visits. And so that little image there with the Navajo children is, is, on, that, is on the bus. So it's a lot more inviting. Um, we want people to feel comfortable and know that, you know, we are here to, um, to have that, you know, that relationship. Once again, this, this is a very good way to to build trust with the communities you work with. Um, and not just, you know, not just imagery, but if, if you're working in, in, in a project, um, consider using logos that could, that are recognizable to the communities you're working with. So if you look at the metals um, logo there, we created that um, to represent both land, air and water. Um, and biological sampling, the DNA strand in the middle, and the Hogan and, and the Adobe homes. And so this is a neat logo to work with because I feel like it's very representative of all of us and, and we get the idea of, of, of what we want to accomplish. Um, so I've had many people reach out to me to, to create logos. The one right next to the metals one is uh, the a Nuclear Truth Project. And when, when we speak of indigenous, um, this opened my eyes to not just indigenous to North America, but we have a lot of other indigenous people across the land. Manuela talked about the uh, uh, aboriginals from uh, Australia. We have a lot of other indigenous people across the world. And so that um, logo was created to, to kind of represent those that live in and around um, radioactive sites and abandoned mines and such across the world. And um, yeah, our most recent one was for uh, Dave Hansen's team with the Rally West um, logo that we worked on to represent, um, you know, clean energy, uh, water, um, wind energy, solar energy um, ideas for, for their upcoming project. And uh, I had fun creating these logos and I feel that they are recognizable and that it, it, it does work with, with and around tribal communities. It is a good practice to, to be inclusive uh, visually for these communities. Um, so I just kind of want to talk about some of the examples that I um, work in outside of metals as well. Um, uh, right now, uh, me and uh, Dr. McKenzie are involved in the patient engagement cancer genomic sequencing group where we uh, create um, cancer communications for um, indigenous communities. Um, we are going to be undergoing uh, uh, genomic sequencing studies with cancer patients that are from um, 
uh, Native uh, communities and uh, I've been tasked to help create educational material, whether it be brochures, glossaries, online uh, resources. Um, and even this is the first time this 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 whole artist in residence thing has been been blossoming in layers. I guess it's like an onion. <laughs> There's a lot of layers to it that I hadn't seen. And we keep moving through these levels. And I hadn't realized that it's not just the art and the visuals we should be focusing on when we're communicating to our tribal communities, but ensuring that they have um, adequate access to health, science, um, um, material that is, is at their literacy levels. So I've been working with Tamar um, Ginosar, uh, uh, a communications expert to, to ensure that we are communicating at the right level to these communities, um, whom of which some uh, only have up to high school education or less. So we want to make sure that we are wording these things and that we are um, making it as understandable as possible across the board. And so being involved in the consent form was just like a new thing for me. Um, and the biggest takeaway from that is um, in, in, in now, you know, it, it, I think about other consent forms and other research programs out there taking biological samples. And uh, there's areas in the consent form where we talk about possible harms. A lot of it is like, oh, you know, we'll, we'll draw blood, it'll be a needle prick. That's probably the gist of, of the harm. Um, other harms that are very unique to tribal communities uh, that we had to address was spiritual harms. The possibility that the type of research we're doing could go against your um, your taboos, your your community's uh, tribal protocol, your your um, cultural protocols might be um, questioned here, or or it could go against your beliefs. And so we we had to put that out there, and especially when it comes to biological sampling. Um, I mentioned before uh, the holistic worldview, where most indigenous communities think of themselves whole. So when we give up a piece of ourselves, therefore a piece of ourselves is, is floating around and not with us. And so giving these options to um, have return, not just return of results, but return of samples uh, in respectful manners, um, certificates of destruction of, of blood, hair, or um, other like nail clippings, samples, um, is a way to, to to meet these communities in the middle and, and ensure that their spiritual well-being is also safe, not just their physical, not just their, you know, um, possibility of uh, data um, um, uh, security, but that we're making sure that their spiritual well-being is also guarded and protected. So um, in this uh, cancer center, we've been using, again, the idea of using beadwork to help describe cancer genomics. So you can see on the very bottom right pamphlet, I'm using uh, the Heshi necklaces from, uh, you, you'll see from the Pueblos and the, the um, turquoise necklaces that a lot of other tribes wear, Navajo wear, uh, the, the um, strand necklaces. And I use that to help describe what we'll be doing in genomic sequencing, like a DNA strand, we're gonna be sorting out and using the idea of the different patterns in a beaded necklace as how we're gonna look into your pattern um, or your genomic sequence and, and where your cancer came from. So this is a neat project, it's still ongoing, keeps me very busy. Um, also something that came to light during um, or why art was so important and artists um, answered the call during um, the COVID-19 pandemic um, that started in 2020 or the end of 2019. Uh, that is when I feel like a lot of us realize how powerful art can be. And so um, we did get, um, and I, I'm saying we as in fellow artists, I know I'm not the only one out there that answer this call, but uh, we heard that a lot of our tribal communities were not adhering to uh, COVID safe precautions, um, you know, hand washing, distancing, and, and things like things like that were not happening in our communities. And, and the spread of COVID just, it's just, it was detrimental. 
and we're still we're still in it now, but we realize that the the material released from folks like um, at the CDC, uh, their infographics, although beautiful and very informative um, to us who who are at a college level or who um, who uh, aren't speaking a second language, were very effective. However, our tribal peoples did not think that way. Um, they continued to ignore. Um, what CDC was releasing because um, as said by one community, it had nothing to do with the native experience. So therefore we answered the call as native artists to create PSAs, to create uh, imagery um, showing our uh, resilience on top, you know, that's something we wanted to protect our resilience. We are fighters. We are, uh, we want to protect our culture. We want to protect our language and our children. So. We had to put that art out there through our, our uh, cultural lens, through through these ideas. And I mean, distancing is a very difficult subject to talk about, especially in communities that where we do everything together, our Pueblo feasts, our um, solstices, big group, big giant village gatherings. Uh, very hard to tell our people not to do that during this unfortunate time. And so these, Images were created um, and we uh, gave them out through um, social media. We even printed stacks of these and, and shared them physically. We dropped them off at um, at clinics and res uh, uh, rapid response centers. And um, this just became a, a bigger thing. Um, these are the middle ones are door hangs. A lot of people said, oh, this, the, the, the signs the hospital gives us that have big uh do not enter they're ugly they make me feel bad they make me feel um like i'm not part of the community or shouldn't be and so they requested door hangs that didn't quite say you were exposed so you're you're quarantining but they wanted some stuff for everybody to say hey we're not accepting visitors we're not you know we're trying to keep ourselves healthy um so uh these were created and um as well as uh the painting there on the left, um, utilizing the idea of the immune response and autoimmunity paintings to describe the MNR, mRNA vaccine um, and to address vaccine hesitancy um, because uh, we needed to, to teach people how this vaccine was created and what it was gonna do for our bodies. So you can see that there, the spike protein being utilized and introduced to the cell and the cell recognizing that protein and beginning to attack the COVID, um, the coronavirus coming into the body. So along with that, um, I also work with the Honoring Native Life uh, uh, UNM Community Behavioral Health Program. Um, we also recognize that we not only need a native uh, indigenized imagery for uh, COVID PSAs, but we need it to address the idea of behavioral health and mental health and and uh, well-being of that sort. And it's a very difficult subject to talk about within our tribal community. So uh, a, a good sized group of us, um, all multidisciplinary uh, behavioral health therapists, um, educators, um, social workers, public health workers got together and created um, the these uh, PSAs. Some are in video format and some are were like little postcards that we got to send out to the communities. And uh, we made sure there were resources for them because we recognized the burnout and the stress and the fear and just just the, the how things were going and how we all had to quarantine um, and seclude ourselves during the pandemic. And we realized that there was a shortage of individuals reaching out um, so um, this is the work that we did. There's a link right there on the bottom if you want to look at the um, the uh, videos. Um, our biggest thing was to uh, address grief and mourning. Um, we were not only grieving people that we lost from the coronavirus, but uh, as I had mentioned before, it was really hard to tell our people not to gather. So we were grieving ceremony. We were grieving the loss of gathering. We were grieving so many other things that I think a lot of non-native therapists and counselors would have not understood had we bought it to them, to their offices to, to help us work through. So 
this is a really good thing and I'm still involved with them. And so we, we work together to, to um, make sure that um, our material is, is relatable to the communities we're reaching out to. Um, all this work is definitely not done alone. I have a great team. I work with scientists, I work with community liaisons, um, and I and I want to continue to be able to reach out to the different communities that um, we're working with and all the projects we have, especially in metals. We have a lot of stuff going on and uh, such things like microplastics, and, and we've been trying to make <laughs> imagery around um, epigenetics, and now we have climate change. And so how do we how do we begin rolling this out? I would love to see other people involved, other artists especially. I would like to find a way to teach this if, if it's something we can do. And I, it's always that question, do we teach the scientists to work with artists or do we teach the artists to work with scientists? And I believe it is a, a collaboration between not just an artist and a, and a scientist, but also, you know, cultural knowledge keepers. And so uh, me and uh, Dr. Um, Anjali Moldsadani, am I saying your last name right? But Anjali and I uh, put in a um, uh, an application to the pilot award through here, through the P50 Center, um, the science communication program to connect environmental health science research with indigenous communities. And yay, we got it. We are going to roll out this neat program. We're still in the early stages of, of planning and how we're going to do it, but um, we initially, initially stated that we wanted to create a cohort of about 10 groups of three collaborators to make creative science communication material from um, metals projects. So we have you know, research personnel, uh, grad students, or uh, early stage scientists working with um, artists and cultural knowledge holders. And uh, we want to make, um, and it doesn't have to be painting. It doesn't have to be 2D design. There's so many other things. There's photography, there's um, poetry, weaving, dance, spoken word. Maybe even we, we can make podcasts out of these um, communication efforts we have for um, the communities that we work with. So this is something neat that's gonna be rolling out and we'll be in touch on how we're going to um, recruit and how we plan to um, engage with everybody. So if if you have somebody in mind that will work for this program, please reach out to me or Anjali. Uh, we want to focus on the communities we work with in metal. So that's Laguna Pueblo, the Cameron chapter, Redwater Pond chapter, and um, Blue Gap Tachi. So yeah. That was um, my quick uh, run through and somewhat update of where the Artist in Residence program is. I continually uh, network with um, many people to, to, to keep this going and to, to keep the interest alive out there. I mean, I want this to be utilized, this, this process of utilizing arts, of health communication, science communication. I want it to spread. I want everybody to have access to it. So. Um, please reach out if you have any suggestions or ideas, but thank you. Thanks, Mallory. That was great. <clears throat> um, and I'm very excited to hear you got the pilot. Nobody told me. <laughs> so, um, yeah. So, yeah, let's talk about what how to make that, that work. And Manuel and I are, I think, both really interested in in helping in any way that we can too. Um, I'd like to just throw it open for questions. questions? We're getting close to the three o'clock time, but um, if you have a question and wanna just uh, unmute yourself, I think everybody's able to do that. And I'll try and pay attention to the chat. But thank you from Tiber and Kim Brown. Yeah, thanks so much. Um, I learned a lot from both of the, the presentations and being able to walk virtually through uh, the exposure exhibit is really cool as well. And I finally got the hang of it towards the end there. <laughs> Sorry for a little uh, bumpiness in the beginning. 
Um, I just I had a really random question about um, some of the artwork you showed for the genomic sequencing. Um, I noticed a bird. I was wondering where what the background was of or the um, decisions behind the the bird artwork. The bird artwork. Um, the bird imagery in in the yeah um, the, the brochure. Yeah, I use a lot of the the um, the bird imagery because. Um, the symbology and iconology for uh especially Pueblo people we have a lot of um, designs on our pottery and they, they all have meaning and so with the cancer center we wanted to make sure we have symbols that represent health strength positivity luck so birds um, are considered in Pueblo pottery water creatures um, they are messengers to the to the ancestors and so the hummingbird and um the uh the water birds you would see um, on pottery are, are considered luck and good for well-being. So we use them and uh, our core design would probably be the dragonfly, which is um, a good uh, symbol for um, uh, healing as well, because we are dealing with people who have cancer and we don't we don't want to overload them on all the science stuff too much. We want to make sure we're also um, ensuring that their their uh, well being is is protected. I just want to thank, thank you, you so much. This is just an incredibly wonderful presentation. I just um, listened to every word, and I think um, this is something that isn't generally known out in the, in the general public. So I think. Um, um, we can have it on our website so people more people can go see it. Well, we will put it on the website and maybe you can have it on a, a UNM website as well, but so that people can come in and have the chance to watch these presentations. But I can't thank you enough. That I it's just so engaging and I think it just shows the importance of using art and community knowledge and communication strategies and compassion. They're so important and they all just shine from your presentations. Thank you. More questions? Well, I just want to thank you guys again, and um, it's really great to see that exposure exhibit and, you know, show that it's not just, um, you know, uranium and, and radiation issues here, that you know, many indigenous populations all over the world. Um, and Mallory, I really want to thank you for including in your presentation, I hadn't really thought about the imagery and artwork as, you know, kind of building trust, and um, I think that was really good to hear as well, and um, really thoughtful. Thank you. Uh, I think we're just coming can up. Can I just also? Yeah. Can I just also ask? Oh, I think she got cut off. Oh. Yeah, I was wondering if that was my audio. She was cutting in and out a little before. <laughs> Sorry about that. Oh, oh there, there she there is. You go. <laughs> okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Is yes. this better? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Manuela, is the um exposure exhibit going to be in El Paso? Is that a real memory or did I make yes, that up? Yes, that's correct. Um, so it will open at the El Paso Museum of Art on July 28th and will then end on November 12th. And I'm very exciting, excited about this venue because it's uh, close to the um, test site of the atomic bombs. And um, the people living in that area are considered um, downwinders, but um, they never received the compensation unlike other locations. Hmm. No, and I think a little more accessible site for a lot of the people on the call. So I wanted to make sure people knew that. Um, could you send us, would you have a list of where it's going um, in the next year or two? And maybe you could. I can type it real quick in our uh, comment uh, section. It'd be great. And then maybe you yeah. could send it to Carol and then she could send it out to everyone because I'm wondering if it comes to the West Coast at all or um, like around Hanford or like um, 
and even the East Coast, it's just um, a fabulous exhibit and your commentary just was wonderful. So um, yeah, if you could send us that, I think it would be great. And while I'm talking, I also wanted to give a particular shout out to um, Mallory because you you handled some really important topics in your art and there are things that don't usually get discussed like that, um, like how taking a biological sample can be, can, you know, in certain, especially in Navajo can be, um, really, really dangerous to your spiritual and your physical well-being and um, how you handle that. And then certain other things that don't usually get said, but are, are so important in terms of, of community communication. Um, and then to do it through art is just, I think, spectacular because you, you know, I would have looked at all of your, your, um, your, your slides quickly at first, but when you started explaining what they were about, and, and the same with Manuela with the exhibit, you start seeing all these different levels of what you're actually talking about. Um, it's there in the art, and then you keep going back and looking at them more and more, and I just, I just want to commend both of the presenters because this was just, um, I think it was spectacular. Thank you. I believe art is supposed to uh, create that dialogue. And so I'm hoping that others out there are able to share further information within their talking groups and, and their families at home to be able to speak on, on really sensitive issues because there's a lot we can't really talk about. But if we open the idea, then we're not force feeding it either. So that's that's kind of one of the other reasons why um, you know, spiritual taboos, um, there's ways to get around it using art and to be, still be able to have robust discussions and have people informed um, as best as possible. Yeah, in my, my experience, um, artists are often the first ones in the society to uh, communicate important um, topics that um, affect all of us, you know, better and, and uh, earlier than most other people. Mm -hmm. oh, absolutely. Great. And um, Manuel, I also wanted to ask if it was okay to share that same link you sent to me for the virtual tour. Yes, of course. Mm -hmm. Yeah, everyone is welcome to try out the link I shared at the top of our chat and uh, visit exposure at your time. Okay, I'm just going to share it again as well in case for, it didn't come up for those uh, who joined a little late. Now. And then I'll email that out as well. Okay. I don't have any other questions. Thank you so much. This is really great, thought provoking and exciting session. Thanks for your time. Manuela, I have one more um, thing to just suggest. Mm -hmm. If we can, um, the next time we talk, if we can also think about ways that we might um, use some extracted version of the um, exhibit. In, an, in, in that annual meeting we talked about earlier, where yeah. all of the Superfund centers should, will be coming to Albuquerque. Mm -hmm. And so thinking about maybe if we can integrate you talking about it and having something that we could display there, that would be great. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I'm getting a, a great idea response from another one of the centers. So that would be great. We'll talk about that in March. That sounds good. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any 